Hi everyone and welcome to my guide for the Tarasha Meteor Wizard. This is one of the overall best builds in the game for pretty much every purpose. It is like the Ultima Blaster build basically and extremely ridiculously powerful in Season 28 as well. I've already played and pushed this quite a lot in Season 27 when it came out with the rework. And in Season 27 this build barely benefited from the Season theme. But in Season 28 we're gonna get a very powerful theme. And this build is going to pop off and destroy everything. It's going to be part of the format meta. If you're not running with necromancers, you will be running with a wizard. It can achieve some of the highest XP per hour in both solo and group that we have ever seen. And it will be basically one of the easiest 150 clears of all time. Together with the Nova Necromancer. What you see here in the background is a clear that I have done on the PTR. This is a GR150 solo without using any potions at all. So without the power pythons, without the shrines and all that stuff that you're going to get. And this was also before they buffed the altar even further with another 40% extra DPS for everyone. So this is not really the easiest 150 here right now under those conditions. But when the season actually goes live, we have a lot more power. You can use those potions and clearing this 150 will be not really a big deal. Overall, it will require a bit more work than, for example, the Nova Necromancer, which has only one downside, which is you have to tr do some shenanigans to kill the boss. But outside of that, yeah, Nova Necromancer is going to be probably the first class or the first build to do solo 150. And then comes the Tarasha Meteor Wizard already. Now, some things to be aware about, as you have just seen here, is that this build can actually be a little bit laggy. So, uh, especially in the large poles and especially in group play, those ground dot effects from all those meteors coming down all the time actually produce quite some lags. It's not like the craziest thing ever, but especially on a season start, especially with a lot of people on the servers and with rather low damage to, you know, not really blast through those 150s or whatever tier you might be doing, you can definitely lag out quite easily. And in those cases, you've got to be more aware about, for example, your conventional element cycle to deal damage at the right moment so that you don't lag out the game entirely because that can actually happen. And what you see here is actually a very good example of this uh, lag problem that I just explained. So even in solo, this can happen, especially when you use black holes. So this is also something to be aware about. In those extremely dense poles, like here on the zombie grotesque map, you press black hole, you can quite easily lag out from that skill plus all the ground dots coming together. So in those cases, you might not want to press that skill. So I have updated the defeat planners here and I have all the different narrations down here. You can find the link in the description. And if you look at those different setups here, you're going to see a lot of similarities, but there are some important differences as well. So number one is there are two different main pushing variants, which is cold with the comet rune and arcane with the star packed rune. So they work fundamentally different because star packed consumes all of your resources whenever you throw them. So you can see this here, my arcane globe is constantly filling up and going back to zero and filling up again. And this is generally the better AOE damage version. So the only reason why this works so well is because you have a lot of arcane power recovery from arcane power on crit from the season 28 theme and also magic weapon conduit. So this skill itself also gives you arcane recovery and like this in large enough pulls, this becomes a better version. That being said, especially early in the season and especially late in the season, Cold definitely has a better reason to be played because when it's just about clearing 150, Cold is usually a little bit easier because you don't have to fish so much for this like high density to make this arcane, you know, really pop off with this high arcane power recovery. And also Cold protects you better from freezing enemies all the time. And it's just all around easier to play and it's also more tankier because you get one extra skill slot that doesn't have to be this magic weapon. On the other hand, later in the season when we get to a speed running scenario and people are time attacking like solo under 50, 3 minutes or something like that, Arcane also doesn't really have much room to profit from big pulls because everything is just decimated in seconds. So in that case, there is this kind of sweet spot for Arcane probably somewhere, you know, mid-season, you know, somewhere at like mid-range Paragons where you play Arcane and otherwise on the low and on the high end, probably cold. That being said, if you're playing this in a group as like a trash killer, for example, in 4-man on 150s or whatever, 
you definitely want to play Arcane because you have to support the barrier and it can pull enemies to you and can ground some of them together. And you profit a lot more from this whole density scaling and you deal a lot more damage with these impacts of the meteors. So in that case, it's basically guaranteed that you play Arcane. But again, there are also speed runs if you just do like a bit lower tiers or these runs are just super fast. Cold is also a really good option. Now let's talk about the set itself a little bit. Tyrasha is a little bit more complicated than most other sets. So here you have to use four different abilities to gain all the set bonuses. And each of those abilities has to be of a different element. So a wizard has cold, fire, lightning, and arcane. And you need to have at least one of those skills on your bar to make the set work. So in most cases, obviously you have the meteor itself and you also have storm armor. Storm armor always gives you the lightning element because this gives you lots of damage reduction from the halo of Karini. And then you have either the cold or the arcane meteor. So in the case of a cold meteor build, usually you can do a familiar. So here's the fire rune on familiar that already covers three different elements. And then you need an arcane skill, for example, the black hole spell steal. This one also gives you a nice damage buff. So whenever you use that in a large pool, it can up to like double your DPS or so for a few seconds. And if you time this well with a conventional elements nuke, for example, you're going to decimate. And exactly the same concept also applies to all of the other variants in this build. So for example, in the arcane version here, you have the arcane meteor, you have the lightning from the storm armor again. So this is a given. You have the familiar and then, for example, we go with a cold black hole. Or we just use like one of the other random generators. So instead of actually spending arcane power, you can use one of the signature skills. For example, just like the cold magic missile. And you just throw it out there and this way you can get this fourth Tarasha stack. And then those stacks will just repeat themselves infinitely as long as you keep casting your meteors. It's because one of them is the familiar and the familiar actually resets the timer on this Tarasha buff. You can see it here on the buff bar. And whenever I throw the meteor, I have another element. And as long as you alternate two different elements, you constantly reset the timer and you never have to worry about pressing those other skills again. Next, we have a total of four crucial items that work with Meteor that are required to make this build. So number one are the two staffs. We have the Grand Vizier and the Smoldering Core. Generally, you want to equip the Grand Vizier because it's much easier to roll a good version of this. Do not try to reforge or something like that a Smoldering Core because this one always comes with a socket. So if you ever spend any materials, try to get this one. And they both massively buff your Meteors. So Grand Vizier in particular is really powerful. It gives you 50% resource cost reduction for Meteor and 400% damage. And you have the Smoldering Core that gives you 50% extra damage, stacking out to 10 times for each Meteor impact recently. So this is kind of this like stacking effect that you can notice, especially when you're doing speed runs. If you do like, let's say 125s or 120s or something like that with this build, you start doing more and more damage until everything just explodes. In a push scenario, this is not really that noticeable because you usually need a lot of impacts to actually finish enemies. So you don't really notice the stacking effect at all there. But for speedruns, this is something to consider. And there are actually variants, for example, in uh, a fast speed GR version here, where you drop the smoldering core, but you keep the Grand Vizier because it gives you unconditional damage buff, even though it's a bit smaller. Next, we have the Member of Twilight. So this item is extremely powerful. It gives you the Meteor Shower Rune, which means that every Meteor type that you cast produces seven impacts. So this alone gives you a times seven multiplier. And on top of that, you get another times five damage multiplier. So this item is absolutely ridiculous. And as soon as you get this and you're playing this Meteor Wizard already, you're going to destroy it like from one moment to the other. So this is how you produce all these impacts and this is also how you stack the smoldering core very easily, very quickly, because every time you throw meteors, you actually get seven of them and they kind of like just fall in like a little area in like random places. So not all of them might hit uh, all the targets because the impacts are not really super large, but in general, you cover like a pretty large area as you can see here. So these meteors keep falling and this is a very good way of clearing up these high density trash pools, especially in teams. And finally, we have the Nilfur's Boast. So this is another Meteor specific item. It gives you 600% extra damage and then up to 900% extra damage if you only hit very few targets. So this helps you out with a bit more boss damage. And as you can see here, the boss doesn't die super fast, but it's just all right. So you can kill bosses on high tiers, even like this 
in something like around two minutes. Depends a bit on like their hitbox. Some bosses have a um, rather large hitbox, so you hit them with more meteors. Others have rather small hitbox. Maybe you have a pylon. So there are these kind of differences. But in general, you don't have that much trouble. The one, one good part about the build is that it's generally very easy to play and it has not really this high frequency of like clicks required, for example, like other builds that are just very fast paced. You have two staffs in this build, so you have very low attacks per second and you just keep clicking, right click, right click, right click in that kind of rhythm and it's very smooth and chill to play. The only things you really have to watch out for is a bit of the positioning and make sure you don't take too much damage. And this is where we get to the next part, which is the Squirt's Necklace. So Squirt's Necklace is definitely recommended, especially on the higher end. It gives you up to 100% extra damage, but you have to protect your life with shields all the time, which luckily is quite easy to do on a wizard. So we have the Galvanizing Vault Passive for that, and this gives you 6% of your life as a shield if you don't take any damage in 5 seconds. What this means in practice is that sometimes you have to retreat a little bit and go out of the danger zone and try to not get hit for a while. Or, for example, on the cold meter build, you also have diamond skin. So you can press diamond skin to actually have a full coverage of five seconds of not taking any damage. And then you get this galvanizing ward shield again and you are protected and your squirt's necklace stays up. But this also depends a little bit on the exact situation and the fight that you are in. So when you have a lot of elite packs and they have a lot of things like uh, Vortex, Thunderstorm, you know, stuff that hits you from range or there's a lot of ghosts and archers, then it's very hard to actually keep this shield up and so you just don't really care about it. But there are a lot of other fights where this is quite possible if you're a bit careful when you press the diamond skin in the right moment and then, you know, sometimes try to get out of danger here and there. You can get that Squirt's Necklace buff. Or you get a shield pine, for example, that just protects you outright for two minutes. On the most boss fights, you can keep up the buff very easily because most bosses are very slow and don't really hurt you much, especially if you stay at a range. So there are these kind of scenarios where you have the buff almost no matter what. If you, for some reason, do not want to play around this Squirt's Necklace at all, there is also this low paragon comment version that I made here with the Tarasha amulet and the Guardian set. So especially on low paragon, if you like paragon 1k or something like that, this is an option, but not really much beyond that, because all girls plus the Squirt's Necklace just pulls ahead significantly once you can keep up the buff kind of all right. And in Season 28, with all the extra toughness buffs from the Altar, this is more doable than ever. So even here, you can see here at 1.5k, in a rather dangerous pull, I have 10 Squirt stacks. Uh, most of the time, as long as I don't get constantly hit here, and... It wasn't really too crazy to keep this up in most of the easier scenarios when there are not five elites present and bombarding me with affixes all the time. So this is really just kind of like the starter version that I would recommend here. And then you would definitely swap to this all girls plus squirts combo later on. And the thing is that especially if you also want to make it a bit easier on yourself by playing the cold version, you are tankier because of this diamond skin that you get for free, which otherwise would be the magic weapon Cornwood in Arcane. So this helps you to also get more shields, protect the Squirt's Necklace, and you don't have to worry so much about it. Because if you don't have the Squirt's Necklace buff, and if you don't have this, this setup with all girls plus Squirt's, yeah, your damage is actually not really all that crazy. And the 150 can be a problem if you don't fish for like some Ultima crazy rift. So in that case, you can definitely notice a gap between the different setups. The last important piece in the setup here is the Convention of Elements. So this is just included as kind of like a yeah, passive extra damage bonus and also definitely recommended. There is the option to actually play this Orgles version here with the Squirt's Necklace with a Unity if you really want. So if you want to play around this and then go Unity to have an easier time staying alive and protecting your shields, that is an option. And it's probably better than this Guardian setup here once you can play around the squirts uptime. So here we have the convention of elements and you don't have to really worry about it. It's just like some passive extra damage. One thing you can do is using the black hole right before a convention. So for example, if you're playing the cold variant like here in the background, I try to use it around during the middle of arcane cycle or something like that. If I have a large pull ready and then you just throw those meteors on cold. And on the other hand, when you're playing the arcane version of the build, you can just do it basically whenever you want because it doesn't actually buff you. It just groups up monsters tightly, so it's still good to do during the lightning COE. 
right before Arcane to have monsters stack for area damage, but compared to the cold version, you don't actually get a buff from it. When it comes to the legendary gems and the passes, there is not really that much special here. We have the Bane of the Trapped, always a very powerful choice. On the Cold Meteor build, this is permanently up on everything, and even on the Arcane variant, you do proc those Cold Meteors sometimes. You can have your follower also slowing stuff, and you also have the Taunt effect from the Meteor Impacts, which is here on the Small Drain Core. So that also produces uh, a crowd control effect for Bane of the Trapped. Then we have the Zay Stone of Vengeance. So you're trying to stay at range to synergize with the Power Hungry, which also gives you more damage at range. So you want to stay at least 30 yards away at all times from your main targets at least, and make sure that you also stay out of harm's way. So this also has good synergy with this whole Squares Necklace playstyle, trying to keep up your shields. And then there's Blur, just like some extra damage reduction that helps you out. And finally, we have the Bane of the Stricken. So in the solo push, this is what you use to kill a boss. And as I mentioned, the boss kill time is all right, nothing crazy. And in four man, depending on what role you do, you don't really need this Bane of the Stricken. So you can replace this with something like a Bane of the Powerful, for example. So this is what you usually do as a trash killer. Or when you do like two or three man pushing or so, then you also keep this Bane of Stricken. So it's actually pretty much exactly like a solo variant here when you do two man pushing, for example, and you're the only DPS. Now at this point I also need to talk about the Halo of Karini. This is a very important item that is the only reason why you're actually staying alive. So you can see this buff on the bar or you don't sometimes. So this has a very high chance of actually just randomly running out and you just die on the next hit that you take because it's 80% damage reduction. This is a massive amount of damage reduction and if you don't have it then you are just paper. So you have to watch out for this a little bit and the way this works is that you have to stay far away from enemies and your storm armor randomly zaps enemies. So you can see this little like purple beam sometimes. This is the storm armor zap. And that gives you this Halo of Karini buff. But for example, sometimes when you run around and there is no enemies nearby, you do not have this buff. And if you just like jump in or you get hit by like a thunderstorm or something like that, you can just immediately die. There is one way around that, which is changing the rune on the storm armor from Power of the Storm, that is usually the way to go. That gives you a reduced uh, cost of your skills to Shocking Aspect. So this gives you like a lot more of these zaps and you have a way higher chance of actually not losing the Halo of Karini buff. Of course, this doesn't protect you when there are no enemies nearby and then you run into the next pack, but at least in general combat, you will not lose the buff like this. In addition, you also have to be aware that this ring actually has a very high range on this affix and even just missing like 1 or 2% or something like that on this uh, damage reduction affix can make a huge difference in your overall toughness. So you need to have a Karini that has at least 77, 78% on the affix or else it's basically trash no matter the stats. So this is something you have to be aware about. So this is a very good candidate for actually sticking it in the cube or for using the new Primordial Ashes feature to make it a guaranteed primal. But even that doesn't really guarantee you a good ring unless you have a lot of rerolls on that. So while the planner here does have this Karini equipped, which is the optimal way to do it if you have the perfect gear, it might be a way better option for most people to actually equip a Ring of Royal Grandeur. Just try to find one that has like a socket or so and like a crit stat. And that's already solid. And then you just stick the Halo of Karini in the cube because this 80% affix is just that important. Do not try to push with some, you know, really high statted ring that has a like crit, crit, area damage, but then it has like some 65% affix. You're giving up almost half of your toughness. This is like not having a unity for free in your build. Obviously, you want to have a high affix roll and good stats on all of your item pieces, especially those here with the Meteor multipliers like the Staff. Then there's also the Convention of Elements but it does matter by far the most on the Halo of Karini. So keep that in mind when you try to gear up, try to stick it in a cube, try to get a good ring of your grandeur, or yeah, maybe you get lucky and you have some leftover materials and then you get a good one here. Speaking of the items, the stat priorities for this build are actually extremely straightforward. It's essentially just the typical crit, crit and elemental stats wherever you can roll them, like the Bracer and the Amulet, and area damage. So this is an area damage build. You try to make large pulls and this is how you decimate those bigger pulls on the higher tiers. And you don't really care about anything else. You don't care about resource or cooldown. Attack speed is kind of okay, but 
yeah, it's not really such a big deal. You can have maybe a resource roll or so, but especially in Season 28, you get this uh, extra resource on crit from the altar. So this should not really be such a big deal once you have that. And you can also replace these resource rolls uh, with an extra life roll, for example, or vitality roll. If you feel comfortable with your resources on this build, just switch this to an amethyst, for example, and you have a bit more toughness like that as well. Now, this does change a little bit if you're talking about speed farming, where you have an adder walker in the setup. So there are some setups like this, where you spend a lot of resources to teleport around, and their resource becomes a bit more important. And you want to have something like hexing pens, perhaps, or a price fall and a resource where you can. But outside of that, especially in solo pushing, it's not such a big deal. And while we're at it, let's talk about those farming variants real quick. They're actually pretty straightforward if you remember all the things I just told you. So there are some different variations here. For example, for very fast runs and low GR, you can run just Adder Walker instead of the Smoldering Core, and you have the Tarasha often. So this is one of those versions where you have to have a lot of resource cost reduction, and you can play the Lightning Meteor. So you just save time by not waiting for those Meteors to come down. They just come instantly with that. You switch around some of the runes here to make sure you have the four different elements and you keep going. So this is very nice and smooth farming as long as you have enough resource cost reduction. If you don't like the Axiom Pants, you can put the Prides Fall here. Then we have the Double Staff variant. So this is effectively a copy of the Solo Pushing variant. So it just doesn't have a Banner of Stricken. You have a Powerful here and you have maybe a bit of extra cooldown. So the Diamond and the Helm, maybe cooldown on the shoulder. This is, ensures that you reset the teleports more quickly, which usually happens whenever those meteors come down, so that you can move around the rift a bit faster. And the time to aim for with this setup is around two and a half to three minutes average per run. You can go relatively high tiers. For example, compared to a god demon hunter, you go probably something like plus 10 GRs or something, but you are slower. So while the XP is kind of comparable, you do get less loot, this is something to keep in mind. And this pretty much covers the entire setup for the Meteor. As I mentioned, we have the link in the description. There's also a max roll guide if you want to check out the written version. There might be some very slight adjustments or so, but overall the same thing in most of the variants. It's going to be quite easy to do 150 solo of this because it's a very powerful build, especially if you farm good gear, if you farm a bit of paragons, and you fish a little bit for a decent run, you can do it, I'm sure. But of course, remember the most important things. You have to stack up this damage buff from the small Rancor. You have to have a good Karini and have to keep it up. This is one of those downfalls where you can just die sometimes. You have to make sure you don't lag out, especially in those setups where you use Black Hole, like the Cold version especially. Or if you play Arcane, you have to have rather large pulls most of the time for this to be effective. And of course, when you start out a run, make sure that you use all four of your elemental skills at least once so that you get those timer stacks. Because only when you have all four, the timer refreshes all the time when you cast your meteors. And if you don't have them, then all the stacks will drop and you're going to be paper and die instantly. And with this, I conclude this guide here. So Meteor is at the peak of its power. So this is like one of the most powerful builds that the game has ever seen, including the season theme. And the nerf is coming anyway. So after this season, I'm sure you're going to see one. So better enjoy it while it lasts. Completing a solo 150 is easier than ever with this build. Or if you don't like the Meteor Wizard, or this seems to be like too uh, difficult for you to execute, there is also the Nova Tragul Necromancer. I've already covered that one in a separate video. I was also going into a lot of detail there. So you can go check that out if you want to play Necromancer. And probably do 150 even easier than on this build. Personally, I'm quite excited to play some more Meteor in this season again. I did play it a lot already in Season 27 and I liked it a lot. So I'm gonna go again because it's just so much fun, it's very powerful and I like the visual effects. It's just great all around. I hope you enjoyed this video. If there's any open questions or something I didn't cover in enough detail, let me know in the comments. So I'll make sure to check that out. Otherwise, wish you good luck in Season 28. Good luck with the 150 push if you're playing this build here, and see you guys next time.